When was the last day you didn't pick up a guitar or a, or a keyboard or an instrument of any kind? Oh, I don't know. Probably like when I went on holiday, but I haven't been on holiday in like three or four years now because I've been doing music um, instead every time my family's gone away. So yeah, it's not been a, it's not been a while since I have not picked up an instrument, uh, especially this year. It's been very intense. Are you writing stuff on it every day or is it maybe just, you know, picking it up and having a play or? I think it's just having a, like, just having a little play with it and, you know, experimenting. I mean, it's kind of hard because I don't know if going on my computer counts as an instrument, but I'm making music on my computer. It's not every day I'll pick up a guitar or a keyboard, but it's pretty much every day where, I, where I'll do something. I feel like the computer is an instrument these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Especially like you can play on Logic through your keyboard is like an actual keyboard so it kind of works uh, but it does also look like i'm furiously hacking away at something <laughs> <laughs> when did you first get into you know playing about with making stuff on logic i presume you did you get into like start playing an instrument first and then kind of progressed onto that and, and making music through logic yeah so i started playing piano when i was about eight and that was the first instrument i learned and then I fell in love with Garage Band when I went and did a trial day at my secondary school and they had um they had MacBooks and I'd never used a MacBook before. And yeah, I just did the classic thing of sort of dragging loops all together and just loved it. Um and then went home and was trying to find like substitutes for Garage Band because I had a PC at the time, so I had a thing called Mixcraft and yeah, I had a YouTube channel as well, so that was always like I'd made little things for that and little covers and songs, so I kind of always had little experiences of doing things like that but it was it was like 16 where I sat down I was like right I'm going to take this seriously as an artist project but I've always been messing about with 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 them with, um, with the software 16 that's what when you say sit down and kind of take it seriously where was your your headspace at was there quite a shift from when it kind of started you know just messing around and it was it quite a conscious thing is this is something I really want to put all my time into and and have a drive yeah I think it was like I mean I've written songs before but I'd never wanted to release them and they were always just kind of for me or I did a club called Song Academy where we where we wrote songs and, you know, they'd never go anywhere. But 16, where I was like, right, I want to start a project. And, you know, that's when I, I, I called it Pig. So I was under a different pseudonym. So it really did feel like a project project. Uh, yeah, I guess it's just just sitting down and being like, these are all the things I want to release. And I'm actually going to try and make them cohesive rather than all these just random covers and little things that I've made over the years. Were you quite driven at that age at 16 when you kind of decided that this was going to be something you were going to pursue properly? Or was it more just kind of messing around and finding things? It was still, I mean, it was still like a certain innocence to it where it was like, I obviously didn't know where it was going or, you know, I was just happy to be making music. I didn't really care where it went and if I if I did well out of it. If obviously I would, like dreamed of having it as my career, but I was just making it for fun. I, I was never trying to become something. What do you tend to write more on now? Can I guitar or keyboard, or what's your kind of go to thing to to create? Well, probably keyboard because that's like most of the stuff I make. Like in terms of little playing around with stuff in software is mostly keyboard but like stuff that actually gets released is mostly written on guitar i think it's like a lot of the keyboard stuff i kind of left behind and i was like i don't really want this sound moving forward but yeah i've always loved keyboard because it's the first instrument i learned so i've got a sort of soft spot for it how does the the instrument you're writing on kind of inform what you're creating do you notice that you tend to kind of write quite different stuff when it comes to guitar and keyboard on each or are there certain um, you know yeah. emotions that kind of come more yeah 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 one? hundred percent i mean like typically with piano stuff it it tends to be a little more emotional or you know i go straight for the sort of synth stuff and that will become you know kind of synth poppy or like a big fan of nostalgic stuff so like 80s sounding uh, kind of things whereas if i go to guitar it's most likely going to be rocky stuff but it's weird because you know there's both sides to to each instrument i've written both soft and and upbeat songs on both instruments it's interesting that you mentioned as well that the guitar stuff tends to be more of the stuff that comes out are there a lot of songs kind of in the archive that don't see the light of day or are you do you oh yeah there's there's hundreds (laughs) like the thing is i i i will typically just create about a minute of a song and then get bored of it and sort of move on and like if I don't push through a creative wave and try and finish the song whilst I'm writing it, then typically it never gets released. So I've just got like hundreds of like minute and a half songs. You know, some of them I do come back to. I'm like, right, I actually want to make that into a song. 
but tip, yeah, typically they just never see the light of day. I don't know. I've made little things on SoundCloud before, little beat tapes of like those sort of things where I was just like, I didn't really want to make a big project, but I was just fucking about with some beats. So it, it came about like that. It must be a little bit imposing, is it, to try and dive back into that if you've got hundreds? It's like, where do you kind of start to, to try and find Oh, yeah. I, I, the thing that's really annoying is I never call anything like a clear name. It's always just like funky little beat or funky beat with bass. So I'm just like scrolling through. I don't know what anything actually is. So, But sometimes I do have fun just like spending a day or two just like going back and be like, oh, I completely forgot I even made this and finding some little gems. Although you're saying it doesn't have a specific name, it must be hard to kind of compartmentalize it at that point when it's kind of so early yeah. in the process. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, none of the songs are finished, so it's not like I can even really give them a name. So that's why they're all, I have probably over 20 files called Funky Something. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's just a mixed bag. Well, you know, when you're kind of looking at your, your music as a whole, it's interesting there's a lot of stuff that doesn't come out because it feels like quite an organic, you know, evolution from EP to EP, from that kind of, you know, acoustic bedroom songwriter to the, the more rockier stuff now. Are there parts of the evolution that we don't see that are kind of hidden in those demos? Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, part of the evolution of the, the, the last EPs, you know, the one that's coming out in December and the one in, in September was that, you know, I'd been playing songs like that live for years. And, you know, people would come see us and they'd hear this soft sort of DIY sound, but then come see us and it's like this big sort of band sound. So a lot of it takes place, like, away from, you know, Spotify or whatever. Um, but, you know, I try and keep, like, uploading things to SoundCloud. I haven't done it in a while, but, um, yeah, I like to think that you can kind of see my progression on there. It's just like little little beats that, that, that never get shown because there's no point. They don't really relate to my journey. It's more just me experimenting with different things. And, you know, there's little things that do make it to the final cut. Like if I've done some sort of special thing with an effect and I'm like, right, I want to replicate that, but do it better and do it better on, on one of the songs that's going to come out. Do you have quite an affection for certain little sounds like that? Do you ever stumble upon stuff and kind of file it away? Just a very kind of specific yeah, kind of sprinkle? Yeah, you? I mean, like typically I don't really sample much. But uh, like different techniques, like I had this, I had this track that I did on SoundCloud once where, you know, I let this delay sort of ring out and then ended up printing that and then cutting a delay. So it was rhythmic, but not within the delay. And I ended up doing that on another track. So yeah, different little techniques will come back that I've used before. To, co- to come back to that progression as well, you know, for, like we were saying, from the, the lo-fi acoustic stuff into the, the rocker thing, it's quite an interesting one because it seems to be a progression and a path that a lot of songwriters kind of go down, you know, if you look at, you know, Biabadubi, who you've worked with as someone who's mm-hmm. kind of gone down a similar thing, or even to, to history, someone like Elliot Smith, you know, it starts mm-hmm. very stripped down and then ends up at this bombastic, you know, kind of huge arrangements. Is that is that a natural progression as a songwriter, or why did that evolution kind of occur for you? Was it something that was always kind of mapped out in your head, or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've I think w- what occurs for most people is that, you know, you start with this DIY sound not because you intentionally wanted a DIY sound, it's because everything you did was DIY, you know what I mean? I didn't have the know-how or, you know, the studios to record the sounds, that you know, the music that I make now. So it was all just like, as soon as I realised I could do it and I have the studio to do it and we can record drums. and You know, a lot of the old stuff, like, for example, my first album, Silk, you know, my mate Daniel went into his old college and recorded about four of the drum tracks in about 40 minutes, which is like nowadays, you know, you'd spend like a whole day on four drum tracks and you'd map them out perfectly and all this. So it wasn't about um, whether or not like I'd obviously like to do that and spend a day on a drum take. Uh, but we just didn't have the time. <laughs> he had 45 minutes booked in, in at his old college and that was it. So we just made it work. Uh, so I think everyone's just sort of branching out now. You know, B, me and B work together. And she, you know, her sound at the start was basically my sound because we were, I was, I knew about as much producing as I did with my own music. So it was always sort of giving it that approach and the DIY. I was learning things as much as she was learning things. There's something quite nice about that, though, that when you look at your body of work and it's almost like seeing someone learning in real time and kind of charting that progression yeah. as a producer I mean, developing that, as well as a songwriter. That's what I've always kind of been proud of, that, like, I've not been afraid to show that I've progressed, you know. A lot of people build up an anticipation for their first release and are scared to do release anything that's not perfect. But, you know, I, I can admit and look back at stuff and go, oh, yeah, that was a bit shit, but... Uh, you know, I'm moving on from it and, and people could listen to the stuff I've released recently and be like, wow, he's really progressed. 
I think when we live in a world, though, when you think about things like Instagram, where everything is so, you know, carefully curated and airbrushed and all that, when you see an artist developing in real time and you have those imperfections, there's something quite candid about it that's refreshing for Mm -hmm. people. I think it's personable. I think given that everyone now has an Instagram, which is so, you know, it's basically your personality in pictures and on a page. So I feel like that's what people kind of like to see, especially in this age, you know, just a little bit of not being fake and just some personality in, in your music do you do you think about things then when you're you know when you're putting out music do you think about it in the broader kind of back catalog of your stuff and how it relates to that or is it more just to kind of focus on this specific body of work so i used to i did my first ep when i signed to date hip bops etc and the next one over thunk you know i intentionally was like i want to transition to a more guitar sound so i needed to find like an in-between sound but you know now i'm just kind of just just being happy with whatever I write and not setting too much pressure on, oh, it should sound like this because it needs to go this place. You know, I'm trying to f- reconnect with the old Oscar where he just he didn't give a shit and uploaded a song on SoundCloud. <laughs> like, because why not? You want people to hear it, you know? So I'm trying to connect with that old sort of style of, 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 of writing. Is it more liberating for you as a songwriter when that pressure's kind of taken off? 100%. It, it, like it's so much easier to songwrite if you don't set a pressure on yourself if you're if you sit down and, and say oh we're trying to write a song that sounds like this it's so much harder than be like i'm just gonna write a song and whatever comes out um i'm gonna make into a big thing and you know you can always adjust arrangements to to kind of sound like what you want but for a while i was quite scared of writing poppy things because i wanted to be some sort of edgy indie kid <laughs> who didn't write pop songs but you know i, I i've gotten back in touch with that do you surprise yourself then more when you're you know allowing yourself that kind of freedom just to do whatever you want or the things that kind of pop up and come through that you wouldn't expect oh yeah 100 percent. i mean one thing that was quite excited about um i just finished doing my album um for this year and you know this year's been quite intense in terms of recording music you know i think i've recorded like something like 27 songs this year which is like a song every Ooh. two weeks so you know it's been quite intense so it was nice like i'm very excited to sort of just make stuff and not have it go towards anything or like because for the past year i've been writing stuff like oh is this going to go towards an ep or is this going to go towards an album but now i'm sort of just free to just make things and and have fun man 27 you said like you say a song recording a song every two weeks what's the rhythm of your workflow like then when it comes to songwriting itself are you how kind of quick are you turning them out if you're able to go in and record one every two weeks? Well, uh, depends, really. I mean, we're not actually recording one every two weeks. You know, I've done them in d- different little sections of, of the year. I mean, typically an EP that's about five songs will take me like a week or eight or nine days. I think Antidote took us nine days to do. Um, so it's quite quick. And, you know, that was one of the things when I was writing my EP over Funk, it actually took me four months to complete. And that was five songs and I was going through quite a bit of a low period at the time and and actually taking that long with songs and, you know, the amount of times we re-recorded things because it didn't sound right, it it hindered the the songwriting process more than it was to just, you know, bosh everything out eight days and have it done. Did you learn anything about your your songwriting from that slightly different approach than taking a little bit more time over it? Oh, yeah, 100%. I learned that it's not good to overthink things. You know, that's why the EP was called Overthunk, um, because I had been overthinking it for four months. Yeah, I just let, uh, like learnt to sort of roll with things. But I also learnt to, you know, push push myself in sort of, in some things. I think a lot of the problem with with some of Overthunk was that I'd, I'd finish a song and then I wouldn't be quite as happy with the lyrics because I didn't really push myself. And, you know, if I go for an obvious rhyme or something... Um, but now I sit down and if, if, you know, the obvious rhyme comes to me, I go, no, don't use that line. Let me think about this next line and then I can move on to the next one. And then you get to the end of the song and it's so much more gratifying being like, wow, these are the best things. You know, this was the best thing I could have made. Do you think that notion of overthinking it, was that partly a result of the headspace you were in at the time? Because if you're in a slightly lower period, it becomes easier. You know, self doubts maybe a little bit more prevalent or? Oh, yeah, 100 percent. I mean... I needed a bit of help. I had been self-producing all of my stuff up until that point, and you know I produced for B as well, and 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 produced for another girl, Molly. So I had kind of got to the point where I was like, right, I have kind of done everything that I know I can produce myself. So when I got in 
me and Rich Turvey, who who produces the Blossoms, you know, we got we got in a session together, and the first thing we wrote was Apple Juice. Immediately, I was like, right, this is what I've needed. I just need someone else to that I can say these creative ideas that I've had for so long, but couldn't execute, and they can find and like Rich can finally be like, cool, yeah, we're gonna do that, and we can run that through a tape machine rather than it just being like an idea of mine that I've had in my head. How did you connect with him? Oh, it was it's actually really bizarre. Because after our first session, I went and said to my manager, I was like, it's really weird. It feels like Rich is like kind of like an older version of me. And then he said to me, like Richard actually said to him, it's really weird. It feels like Oscar is a younger version of me. So it's kind of great having like the same, it's almost like having the same brain. And it's like, it, as soon as I think of something, he's like, oh yeah, I was thinking about doing that too. Like, And he knows exactly what I mean when I describe it. Because I'm quite bad at describing what I can hear in my head because... I can hear stuff in my head when I'm making music where I can like hear the complete song. Um, so I, yeah, I'm pretty shit at describing it, but he just understands it. Have you ever asked him for advice on anything then? If he's like an older version of you, that could be quite quite a useful person to have. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, just working with him has been great for, you know, me learning as a producer and, and different techniques. I've asked him about, you know, the technical side of music, you know, preamps and, and all that sort of thing and, and channel strips and, what plugins he uses and and what yeah I've really like applied that into my own sort of production you know that idea of going in and throwing something else into the mix was this the biggest kind of thing that it had an impact upon your songwriting in terms of you know trying something different or were there other things you'd done previously to kind of shake things up a bit no I, I think 100% that was the biggest change you know I've been for a while I was quite um opposed to the idea of having a producer because I thought you know, I self-produced everything, so I was like, I don't really want someone else's like ideas. I don't think they're going to be as good as what I think my ideas are, or they're not going to understand the way I think. And you know, th- there was producers I had worked with that that were didn't quite understand the way I, I I was thinking and what I wanted. But yeah, it was thank God I found Rich, and you know, that first session I just immediately knew that we'd hit something special. Yeah, I mean with your earlier work and the new stuff in particular as well it's a lot of it's about the spark of your personality and you don't want to dilute that mm-hmm. uh, yeah and that's what you know there's i've worked with people before that kind of do dilute that and and it's very it makes me very annoyed because it's it's really just trying to get i'm trying to describe the way i want it to sound but they just don't understand and therefore neither of us are quite happy has working with him as well shifted your own view of you know what the personality of your music is has it helped to kind of get a slightly different perspective on it in any way i mean slightly i think working with rich because he's been you know making songs for ages he's sort of toned back i was always quite whimsical and and i don't know trying to be funny um and now i learned to to like balance the line between funny and serious because i think i didn't take myself as seriously as i as i should have so he's good at like toning down certain things like there's a lyric in the album where you know (laughs) at the end of the line going into the chorus was my lyric was i think i need a piss (laughs) which was the line before the chorus and then we've changed it now uh, to something that's just a little more serious so he tones down that side of me the wild side it's weird how comedy kind of is seen to devalue art though like if you Mm -hmm. like if you think about you know when people write comedy songs, they're never really viewed in the same light as... Yeah. Or even comedy films. You think about something like Shaun of the Dead, you know, fucking brilliant filmmaking, but it's never held in the same light as the kind of classic cinema. It's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's kind of... Yeah, it's disappointing. I mean, I remember that was one of the things when I released on Bop Success. We had a, a song, French Girl, and um, someone said it reminded them of Flight of the Concords, and I never really intended it to be, like, classed as some sort of parody sort of comedy song. I just thought it was quite, you know, it's quite fun, you know. You know, music should represent all aspects of life and and I think you can have the sadness but also have a little bit of the funny and I don't see why it has to be classed in another category. But, yeah, so I just had to learn to tone it down so it wasn't, you know, people wouldn't view it like a comedy song. The end of that song is brilliant, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, that's what I mean. Like, I just love to have fun when I make songs and it's a shame that people don't take it seriously. Is that you doing that voice, like, kind of modulated and stuff? Or who's that coming yeah. in with the French accent? Yeah, so yeah. that's me That's me with the French accent where I was like, eh, oui, 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 <laughs> uh, my French balcony. <laughs> and then we just pitch shifted it down. Uh, I think that whole the whole process of that EP was really fun. You know, me and my mate Mac, who engineered the record and 
drums on everything. We just kind of sat in a small room with terrible acoustics and at the Dirty Hit studio, just like the side room, not even the main studio. Uh, but we sat in there till like 3 a.m. every night for about two, eight, two weeks. And I think uh, that little outro was recorded near the end when we might have been losing our sanity a little bit <laughs> <laughs> after many, many long nights. Does that unlock something different, though, when you get to that point when you're kind of physically and possibly mentally exhausted with working on a piece of art, the different things come out at that, at that point in the yeah. process? Yeah, 100%. But, you know, I'd say it's like 50-50, really. Some of the stuff you come up with in that time is just completely devoid of anything good. <laughs> like, it's, you know, your brain just feels so tired of anything creative. But also, that's where some of the special stuff can come out because, you know, I wouldn't... I would If I'd done that at the start of the week when I felt fresh, I would have totally overthunk the fact that I had a French accent at the end and it was just this little funny little bit. But because I was at the end, I was like, damn, that's hilarious. Let's move on. You know what I mean? I'm done with this and keep keep moving on. So was that an idea that you had before heading into it, but then waited until the end to record? Or was it something that came out just naturally in the process? I think I I definitely, I wanted a little French accordion at the end. I was like, it's a really nice ending to have. I wrote this little accordion bit and I just got a new plugin where it like simulated different spaces and so i had it like as in the street and it was just this french accordion in the street that, and it sounded it's just like sounded really french and then i just couldn't resist it i was sitting there i was like oh, wee, wee, wee. And i was like well i've just got to put it on really and then that was all sort of improv and at the end it's just me and mac laughing about it can you play the accordion no no no, no, no. that's a, that's like an accordion sound on um although i guess i can play the accordion because it's just sort of a piano that you have to push in and out but yeah, that was just a software sound. I'm fascinated by people who learn to play the accordion because it's never something I've I've heard of anyone doing. Yeah, it always weirds me out when I see people playing like so, I'd, like irrelevant instruments. Like, how do you get into that? Like, when was that first moment where you're like, damn, like accordion's my thing? Just, I was out this morning. I was staying in Glasgow, but I was still in Edinburgh, kind of walking through and saw one in the meadows. And that's exactly what I was thinking. It's just, it's, just, it's always an older guy as well. Maybe the yeah. accordion's dying out. I think it might be. I'm not sure if it's uh, it's made for the new generation, really. I'm not sure if they're <laughs> quite as exciting as a PS4. We need to get some new instruments in, though. I mean, there's some some crazy ones. I saw, I think it's called like an automaton or automophone or something. It's this little guy and you squeeze his mouth open and you kind of use him as like an instrument. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's just mental. I've got one of them because I'm, I'm really bad at impulse buying. I just, he's, I'm a little bit of a child at heart and... You know, at the start of lockdown, I bought a go-kart to ride around my house um, <laughs> just because I love little things that, you know, if it brings me fun, then it's worth it. You say a go-kart? Yeah, it's like this tiny little go-kart thing with a, with a handbrake that you can do like 360s on the spot on. So I was like able to like drift it around my kitchen, but it was like small enough to sort of put away. You're just doing doilies in the kitchen, your girlfriend walks in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we set up a little, we set up a course and everything. My parents went away for lo- like for lockdown. They, they went and stayed in the country. So we kind of had the house to ourselves and we're like, so when he came back, there were sort of tire marks all over the kitchen floor because they've been doing donuts. Have you taken it out in the street yet? Have you taken it for a test drive in the real world? You're not allowed to because um, huh? it counts as like an electric vehicle and they're illegal on, on, on public roads. You can do it private property, but I've not got. I've obviously not got a, a racetrack to access. Uh, I had a mate with a tennis court, and we did that. But I kind of <laughs> put tire marks on this tennis court, so now I'm not allowed back. <laughs> the new, the new single as well seems quite fitting to discuss now. Then antidote to being bored. What role does boredom have in creativity for you? Oh, so much. I think that's when I'm most creative. You know, my most creative hours are like one a.m., two a.m., and that's when I've reached the end of the day and. I've reached peak boredom. It's my immediate like relief to boredom music. You know, if I'm sat there going, God, I'm so bored. Just load it up, load up the software and start messing about and instantly I'm not bored. Is that kind of how you came to music as well? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, it was kind of, you know, I spent my days doing two things. I'd either come home, play some games or come home, and make some music. But I mean, music's always just been a part of my life, regardless of, of me being bored or not. I've just enjoyed doing it. But yeah, I think it, it definitely helps, especially in lockdown, it really helps. Are you a little less bored now, though? Your life doesn't seem boring. No, nah, it's not. It's definitely not boring. But, um, you know, I think it's especially, yeah, just lockdown, sat inside for four months. And I was, I yeah, you know, I recorded both Hand Over Your Head and it recorded Antidote in July as well. So I was kind of sat there for a lot of the time thinking, oh, 
I wish I could play this music live and, and just constantly thinking about that sort of stuff. So it really helped to just sort of dig my teeth into something new and start making different things. What sort of impact did lockdown have on the type of stuff you were writing? Did it tend to be songs like that that were kind of more directly tied to it or were you able to write about topics that weren't present I mean, at that time? I mean, I've always been... I try as a songwriter to write about different topics that, you know, some of them don't even relate to my, my situation. You know, there's the, the occasional song that will come through that's completely accurate. <laughs> it's actually something that I'm describing or something that I've been through. Um, but also, I just like to tell stories. So I didn't really want it to be... I didn't want to write that many lockdown songs. And, you know, I wrote the song Get Out in January and I was so annoyed <laughs> when the whole lockdown <laughs> thing happened because I was like, I can't believe it. People are going to think this is a lockdown song. And yeah, I just didn't want to write something that, you know, everyone's going to be going through this. and Nobody really wants to hear about lockdown any more than they have to. It's funny how life imitates art in that way, though. You know, you write that song in January completely out of relation and then yeah. it's echoed <laughs> a few months down the line. Yeah, I wrote a song called Get Out and then stayed inside for the five, six months. Has that ever happened with more normal kind of life events? Have you written something and then, you know, a few months or a year later, you kind of see it echoed in in your day-to-day life or what's happening yeah i think so you know i i I wrote an an ep called teenage hurt when i was 17 and it was all sort of about me being very lonely at my school and not having a girlfriend and i fucking hadn't kissed a girl till i was 18 so um you know the next next year that came true and i have a girlfriend who i love very much now and we've been together for two and a half years and it's weird to listen back to that song and try and remember how i felt because now i'm just like you made it, you know what I mean? Do you still play it live? No, no, we don't really play any of the soft stuff live. It's just not something I ever really wanted to do. We've done occasional, I think I've played Million Little Reasons a couple of times and we've tried giving some of the softer stuff a go, but it's just, it's not the right environment. And especially as like, I try and take after you know, people like Mac DeMarco with their live sort of persona where I'm just trying to have fun with the audience and you know, the same way on, on, on an EP like, you know, French Girl and stuff, just try and have a bit of fun and be, try and be funny on stage so people walk away and be like, damn, that was, it was more of a personable experience than it is, you know, just going to see a guy who walks out in his sunglasses and there's a big rise when he comes out and go, ah! you know what I mean? I'll come out like, what up, motherfuckers? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I just try to have fun with it. Now that you, you know, it's interesting looking back on that EP then in the kind of context, context with where you're at in your life now, how does being in love with someone kind of impact your creativity and the music you're crafting? Uh, I think it definitely really affected what I was writing at first. I wrote an EP called To Whom It May Concern, which was very, very sort of lovey and, yeah, it just described the way I was feeling at the time. But you know, now I try not to let it sort of influence too much. Obviously, my girlfriend's always there and it's nice to have a second opinion on things. But also, I think it does sometimes take away a little bit from the creative aspects, you know. As much as it was fucking miserable um, being lonely at 2am, 3am, I wrote some great songs out of it. And, it, you know, those sort of things sort of fuel, fuel songwriting. So there's aspects of it that are, that are, are positive, but also things that take away from it. It's that really cruel side to making music where pain seems to lead to great stuff. But then you, yeah. the downside of that is that you're obviously in a lot of pain. So it's, yeah. yeah, it's 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 annoying. How come you were, you know, kind of alienated? Well, would you say you were alienated at school? You were kind of saying you were feeling a bit lonely. Well, yeah. Why do you think that was? What, how were you as a kid and stuff? Why was that? I think, so, I... I mean, my primary school was kind of all right. I mean, I lost my mum to, she had psychosis and and committed suicide when I was seven. So, I mean, that was always kind of underlying. And I I don't think I really processed it that much because I was sort of, I was the middle child and my older brother's autistic and my little brother was like three at the time. So I've kind of always had to move on with things. And then when I went into secondary school, you know, I've always kind of, trying to be funny and I, I think when I was 11 or 12 I wasn't really that funny and maybe a little bit cringy and you know I had a YouTube channel where I did Coldplay covers and stuff so if you go to an all boys Catholic school that stuff doesn't go down well um, and you tend to get you know so I was a little bit bullied at, at secondary school and it sort of all came to the end where I was you know in the social hierarchy I was near the bottom and I was sort of yeah I just wanted to be something else and you know make a different life and I was I was, you know, wondering, will I always be like this? Will I always be that cringy guy? You know what I mean? Were you, were you Catholic growing up? I know you said you went to an all boys Catholic school. Were you Catholic yourself? Were you raised Catholic? 
so I was raised Catholic. My mom's side of the family was Catholic, but uh, you know, I I got to the age of nine or ten, and I was like, I, I can see right through this, um, and I didn't really just understand why people would wanna go to a room and praise to me some imaginary being up in the sky just because someone said that he existed. I got kind of angry at the fact that you know people wasted. I've wasted so much time, you know, an hour every Sunday for most of your childhood is a lot of time. So, yeah, I was quite angry and, and kicked, kicked back at the Catholic school a little bit. I always just found it kind of intense and especially for someone that's meant to re represent so good, so much good in the world. You know, there's a lot of bad things that they do. So I just saw the cracks in it. Is it quite a strict school when you're kind of brought up in that environment? Like teaching yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Catholic all boys school is like the strictest school you could go to. So you know, my whole entire teenage years were dealing with stupid rules. Like you couldn't. My school actually had a rule where you literally couldn't go inside at break time unless it was raining. So you know, you'd be out there in December. And it's like two degrees outside, but we're outside in the playground in just a jacket. And yeah, I just I hate little stupid things like that. Like, why wouldn't you just let people go inside if they're cold? It's such a weird tradition to keep a hold of. Yeah, it's very strange. Are the rest of your family, are they still quite Catholic? Are no, they... so my dad has never really been religious. And, you know, now um, my dad's married and I've got stepsisters um, and no one is religious in my family. I think my little brother was the last to go. Uh, he was religious up until about he was nine or ten. And I think it's sort of faded since then. I remember when he was about eight, he asked for a picture of Jesus for Christmas, which I found hilarious. I mean, although you're saying, you know, it's an hour a week, there are some positive lessons, I guess, to be taken from it as well. You know, there, there's silver linings yeah. to some of the stuff there, too. Oh, no, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not saying that, you know, I, I believe that most people that are, are religious are, are really trying to do something positive. I just think that, you know, the few people that do negative things kind of let them down and I'm, and I'm not opposed to people trying to live more positive lifestyles but for me I just you know I believe in the religion of trying to be more positive and be kinder to people and I don't think to me that relates to any sort of god in the sky yeah I guess yeah like you say everyone's kind of different and some people it's it can work for them and for others it's just it's the complete opposite yeah how old were you though when you when you kind of started to garner traction then? Because were you still still at school when things kind of started to pick up music wise? So I moved schools just after I kind of released Teenage Hurt. Uh, I moved schools. I'd been at public school all my life, and my dad was like, "Right, for the last two years you get a little private school experience." So I went to an art college, um, and then that's when I was like sort of writing Silk because I could study music and music technology, which is what I wanted to study, not music, because that was. I've never been into music theory and I can't read music either. So yeah, I was finally studying what I wanted and I made Silk and, you know, I was working with B and we made coffee and we made lice and that was starting to like get a bit of traction. And I think, you know, people started to notice me through doing that B stuff and we did Moon Song together and which is now at like 20 million streams and something ridiculous. And that's when it started to grow was sort of 2018. Which was weird because, you know, I literally released music in 2018. That was So it, it did grow kind of quickly. I remember the day, like two days after I released Silk, one of the main songs from it, Snacks, got added to a playlist. I was just, like, my monthly listeners went from, like, 10,000 to 25,000 in a day. And I was just so gobsmacked that, like, it just jumped up such a huge amount. Where are they at now? 930,000. <laughs> 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 it's just crazy. That must be some change though, going from a an all boys Catholic school to an art college. I imagine that's quite oh, a yeah. kind of shift. Big in... change. Uh, what was weird about it is that I had kind of so I had I was resitting a year six. Like I'd done a year six form at the all boys Catholic school um, and didn't enjoy the A levels I picked and stuff. So I was resitting the first year. And, you know, I sort of had this attitude of going and be like, right, I'm not I'm not really here for anything else. Um, I'm just going to go and get my stuff done. And, you know, it was a private school in Hampstead. So it was kind of full of a lot of sort of posh, wanky people who either thought they were roadman or were just like really arty. So I didn't really find my place. You know, I met a, a few people there that I really enjoyed hanging out with. You know, an artist called Molly Payton, um, who had moved over from the, um, New Zealand. 
and yeah we became good friends but I actually heard she's friends with someone from the school apparently someone thought I was really cool because I didn't talk to anyone but it was actually just because I was too socially anxious <laughs> uh, to talk to anyone but they thought I came in I was like yeah I don't want to talk to any of these people I get so you if you spent an extra year in school I guess it's maybe not a bad thing kind of gives you a wee bit more time to mature maybe before all the music stuff you kind of get thrust into that adult yeah. world quite quickly yeah, I definitely. I've, I mean, I've always been quite mature in the way I act. I think it was something to do with the, the fact that, you know, I had to move on after my mum died you know, so quickly and sort of be a good kid for my dad because he was a single dad with three kids. So I've always kind of been mature, but that definitely helped me mature because I was a year above everyone else. And so, you know, also a lot of these sort of posh kids would come in and not really, you know, give two shits about school because their dad has, you know, their dad would pay for anything they needed to do. I would sort of look at them and be like, oh, I don't want to be this childish and I want to get my work done and just get in, get out, sort of get it done. And then I can really concentrate on music and have fun with it. It's something to work toward, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But you yeah, kind yeah. of have that goal in front of you and it's easier. Like exams, I remember being in school, you know, exams don't, they're not the best motivator in the world, but if you have that other kind of goal that you're really passionate about hanging there, it can be quite helpful, I imagine, to kind of get through what would have otherwise been quite a tough school experience, maybe. Yeah, and I'm, I've never really been academic. Like, luckily, I can kind of coast and sort of get mediocre grades, and that's kind of what I did all through secondary school. And, you know, in my, I was actually doing my A-levels at the exact same time I recorded Bops, etc., but... To me, at that point, I had, couldn't care less about what I was studying. You know, I'd signed to a label. I was only ever studying stuff so that I could perhaps get into a music uni to go study music. So for me, it was like, right, well, do I learn business and economics A-level or do I write my debut EP after being signed to a label? <laughs> I think that's probably going to get me into the music uni more than an economics A-level. How old were you when you signed? Uh, I was 17. No. Yes, I was 17 and then turned, oh no, I was 18, 18, yeah, 18, but I turned 19 just, I think, as Bops Etc. was released. That must be quite a, a contrast though, like you said, going in, you know, working on that EP and then sticking that out and then also still having to sit in school. Like it's quite, yeah. a, it's kind of two very different worlds. I mean, my dad was giving me a lot of flack at the time, um, especially after paying for me to go to a private school. Uh, there was a lot of, of beef there sort of between me and my dad and I mean, my dad have always sort of had a little bits of beef and been quite argumentative I think because we're quite similar we we don't like to lose a fight so we're always arguing about stuff but yeah I think it was at that point where I was just like I'm not I don't care about school anymore this whole time my dad had been to a million parents evening meetings where it's like oh well Oscar's yeah he's doing all right but he could probably do better and just try harder but you know I just did what I had to do and got it done as long as I get a B or whatever and I can move on and do the stuff that I really want to do, which was music. Your dad's musical as well, or did he maybe see a bit of himself in you? Would he have been yeah, in a so similar my, kind of position? My dad is a writer, so he's always in the, been in the creative field. And, and, you know, he was a musician when he was a kid. He was in he was in the House Martins um, before they went and became hugely famous. He, he left before they did that. But yeah, so he's always been, you know, been in the creative industry, so he understands my way of thinking. And actually, it's really helpful to go to my dad when I'm having troubles, you know, you know, overthinking things and and worrying about my music. Like he just completely understands it because he's thought the same thing about his writing. Are you still quite close now? Are you able to kind of speak about anything together? Or yeah, I think we're a lot closer now that like I've been able to sort of secure myself a career in music. I think up until that point where I signed, it was always sort of like, all right, like you know you can do the music thing but you know i really want you to be doing this education just in case music doesn't go well but you know i proved myself enough to be able to you know so we're on good terms i think it's easier as well once you've left school and you've moved out and there's that lot once you get that kind of space between you it's easier to then kind of reconnect it's tough when you're living with the person all the time yeah 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 i mean i mean i kind of moved time for for lockdown i, I stay in between lockdown and my girlfriend's apartment but i'm looking at properly moving into my own place uh next year and that would be nice to sort of just have my own space especially as you know i'm from a family of seven you know with my stepsisters and my brothers and it's just quite we're very loud uh so it's nice to get a bit quiet at my girlfriend's place who was the you know when you're growing up you mentioned you know b and who was the artist that moved across from molly you, payton molly payton who did you bounce music off before you met them did you show music to other people before you kind of 
had them as you know similar creative people in your life um i had my mates i had my mates daniel um and alex so alex i've known since secondary school uh he's been my mate all through secondary school we've been best mates for years so you know we've always been into the same sort of music so i always had him and then daniel who i met through a friend of his was he he was the one that did all the drums in the early days for silk and was always there to sort of listen to tunes and be like damn that was sick i had to record drums it's such a sick tune or whatever but i never really bounced music off people it was sort of i just upload it and <laughs> i didn't really care what people thought do you find it easier to be you know creative by yourself or when you're kind of around other people in that in a creative environment it depends there's different types of creativity really like it's it's really nice to bounce ideas off of like another artist and, and work with other people but at the same time, there is a sort of energy that you can get, from, like being at two a.m. in in your in your room on your own. They're just different styles of working. Uh, I do love having someone else there to you know bounce ideas, and when you get stuck, you know having another person to suggest ideas you wouldn't thought of. It's in. We, we kind of went on a long tangent there after I brought up the new <laughs> single. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. That that new track is about a specific person, or you know, kind of, or uh, yeah, it's about a specific person who occupies that role of being you know, an antidote to boredom. Is there anything else in your life outside of music in that person that you find you can kind of turn to to, to overcome it? Yeah, I mean, I th- I've always been a huge gamer. I, know, I mean, I know it makes me a huge nerd or whatever, but I do love playing some video games. So that's kind of my other sort of passion. And then I've always had a little bit of a love for filmmaking. So, you know, in the latest of the last EP, I directed two of the music videos because I've always loved making little things. Yeah, I made YouTube videos back in the day and then I got sort of hugely into the Mac to market sort of VHS stuff. So I've always loved things like that and always wondered how they made them and, and wanted to sort of recreate those sort of things without, you know, pulling up an iPhone app of VHS cam or whatever effect. I wanted to do it legit and have everything legit. I'm a big fan of analog gear and, and I'm a bit of a gearhead. Is that the same musically? Do you kind of like analog stuff as well? Yeah, 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 100%. I've always been, you know, one of the first things I did when I got signed to Dirty Hit and I got my first advance for my EP. I was like, right, I'm going to go buy some synths. So I bought a Juno 60 and a Yamaha DX7. And those were like two analog synths that I'd been looking at for ages and were like iconic. And yeah, nothing. It was honestly one of the best days when I, when I got those two. And I was like, wow, I actually own these synthesizers. Like these are mine. Like I never thought I'd be able to shell out your the Juno. is like 1.5 Gs for a synthesizer which was just insane for me. I never thought I'd be able to own one of those. So when I bought that, I was like, wow, like I made it. You know what I mean? Did you have a flurry of creativity when you started working on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, it was immediately, I was like, everything I make on this sounds like magic. Yeah, um, it was always just fun. Like we'd go into the studio and the first thing you'd do, rather than get started on the session, just have a play around on the Juno just because it sparks so much creativity. Do you remember the first time you went into Dirty Hit as well? I know we've kind of spoken about them a few times, the label yeah. you signed to. I mean, it was a bit, it was a weird one because I was kind of like half managing B Badoobie when she, when she started. Um, you know, I, I helped up. I helped upload all the songs to Spotify and I remember I was there when I typed in the name I was like this is a bizarre name I wonder if anyone's gonna be able to pronounce it um so I was I was there when she went in for the first meeting with Dirty Hit and we were always in talks and you know we did patched up together at the start when she first got signed to Dirty Hit so I had always knew, uh, like known the Dirty Hit team and then suddenly in like December I think B was like oh yeah I think they're signing thinking of signing you I never even considered that they'd, they'd want to do that and yeah by March I was signed are they quite a, a close-knit team in there is it a big office or is it kind of small group of 100%, people 100 yeah it's I think I'm not sure how many of them I think there's like 11 or 12 of them so it's like a really small team um especially for a label like Dirty Hit which is essentially like an indie major label you know it's like a huge indie label and, you know, the, I think one thing I've always loved about Dirty Hit is they just, they really let you do your own thing. You know, I've heard horror stories of artists signed to major labels that, you know, they they send them an EP and they're like, right, this is just not good enough, so just send it back and we're not going to use that, you know what I mean? And Dirty Hit have always been like, just deliver us the music and we'll help you with it and we'll upload it and all this. So they're very supportive in that way. Seems like a much more modern kind of approach to things with it there's such an emphasis now upon you know the artist we're speaking a lot about the way your personality is so integral to the music mm-hmm. the emphasis now really is on the person and it I seems silly for a label to try and control they, it 
that's where they excel really in letting the artist be the artist uh, i think when too many people try to get involved sometimes it can get diluted and i reckon if i was signed to a major label you know my my personality would have been really diluted in the music like there's no way a major label would let the end of french girl run or like the intro to box <laughs> etc you know what i mean they just wouldn't let it happen those are some of the best moments though because they like we say you know they completely showcase that that authenticity exactly and it, one of the things you know that intro for the ep i was i made it and i was so high when i made it um, <laughs> and it was just literally such a mess about um and i you know i sent the track to jamie and the intro and that hey the track was all sort of one thing and yeah when it came to deliver it i took the intro out and and jamie jamie oborn texted me like where's the intro gone like we need to get that intro now so he was actually the one that convinced me to put the intro back on that ep which is, yeah, you'd never have that from any other label. It comes back again, though, to that idea of it being, you know, a smaller independent and where you have that personal connection with people who have signed you because they're into the music and mm -hmm. are into the, you know, the personality. Do the videos reflect a slightly different side to your personality as well? I know you're saying you directed a few. They seem to take on a slightly more surrealist quality about them. Yeah, I mean, I think I've always just sort of loved very visual music videos i'm not i'm not a very good actor so i'm not i'm not into sort of story based music videos so when you know we did the first music video hey i was just like yeah i just want all these effects and i want all of this and that's kind of been the general vibe since and i think the ones i've actually am most happy with are the ones i directed myself because it really allowed me I, as i said i'm really bad at explaining what i can see in my head so um for me to just be able to do it uh, it's so much easier and I'm so much more happy with it. Is the way you express yourself with a camera different to the way you express yourself with an instrument? I guess it's kind of annoying because, you know, I always want to film stuff, but the only person that ever wants to film is me. And therefore I can never be caught on film in anything. Like whenever we go to the studio, I'm the one that has to set up a, good, a camera in the corner of the room to, you know, film some stuff so I can just have, just have memories or if I make it into something. So it's kind of frustrating that just like other people don't want to do it as much as me and I can't communicate how I, w I, I want things to look. Like we were saying though, it's interesting. I know you're saying you kind of go for the more visual based things. It's interesting to do that and kind of entwine it and contrast slightly the, I guess in the last EP in particular, that motif of like everyday activities and the kind of mundane that you take and you kind of mm -hmm. contort into something more interesting. Has, has the everyday kind of always been a, a well of inspiration for you? Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think that's what I've always tried to sort of stay with is that, you know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an ordinary guy and I, um, I sing songs about little things. Yeah, like one of the first songs I wrote on the Silk album was, you know, I spent all my day online looking at shit. That was the first lyric of the line <laughs> of, of the song. So it's always just been about the mundane things because nobody ever sings about the mundane things. You know, you don't sing about how you spent all day online looking at ra rabbit eating crunchy carrot ASMR. That's not a thing that people talk about and I just I like to I like to it's funny to talk about those things and I think everyone does them so why not talk about them everyone can relate and if you put them in a song you don't have to feel bad about not being productive because yeah, you've exactly. had that experience that you're channeling <laughs> yeah, into exactly. it yeah. <laughs> I mean when it comes back to the idea of the everyday is there a weather report sampled in apple juice as well no that's me is that, that you again uh, yeah that's me again so a lot of the time I'll have an idea we like oh we should get a weather report and it's just it's like it's, it's genuinely easier for me to just do it um, rather than going out trying to find the perfect weather report for it. So, yeah, it's me. It's like, and everybody, it's 9 a.m. in the morning. Make sure you wrap up well. And <laughs> we just record it down a little radio radio mic. And, uh, yeah, we just like to have fun. And it's those little ideas that I think bring a little magic to the track. That song's on FIFA now as well, isn't it? I know, which was a, a crazy one. Because, yeah, I did, when I had a little YouTube channel, I did FIFA pack openings and things. So it was crazy to like when i got that call like yeah i think um apple juice might be in fever 2021 and, and normally these things you know you hear something crazy and it, it doesn't really ever come it doesn't ever really happen and then i you know i i, I texted my manager like any news on the future thing and it was like oh yeah it's happening and it was like, i can't believe it i'm in fifa um so yeah crazy especially as like i grew up with that game and and the songs from 20 you know, FIFA 14, FIFA 15 were like the soundtrack to my teenage years. So it's weird that my song gets to be that for someone else. FIFA's always kind of been the perfect introduction to so many, I mean, particularly indie to a certain degree, but so many different kinds of music. 
yeah like when you yeah. kind of start off discovering stuff it's such a a well to kind of dig into and find stuff you wouldn't otherwise know about and what was nice was that like you know i think for a while fifa sort of went sort of dance track vibe with their soundtrack but you know i see a, a whole bunch of people comment on the apple juice music video like it's just the best song on fifa really brings back that old fifa vibe which is which is weird because you know i played the, those old fifas and i think it's kind of influenced the way my music sounds what other sorts of stuff did you used to do on your YouTube channel then? Because I know you said there you did oh. acoustic covers, you did FIFA pack openings. What other stuff would we expect to find on Oscar oh, Lang back in the day? All sorts, you know, covers I did. Oh, I've had a YouTube channel since about nine. Like it's all private now, so you can't find it. But uh, yeah, I did gaming videos, little gaming news videos, and I did covers and and made my own original songs. I remember I was. I was quite, I had one, I used to make little beats and not really know what to do with them. So I just put them up as non-copyright free beats that anyone could use. And I got really excited when one of them actually kind of like people were using it. And I think in the end it had like 20,000 views, which was crazy for anything that I'd made. Because previously the most viewed thing I'd had was about 100 views. Although you're saying they're all on private, are they still on there? Are they still on the servers lurking about? They're still lurking about because I do like to go back and visit them. But I don't think I could ever really delete them because they're kind of like my childhood, you know, in in videos. But uh, yeah, I'm not... <laughs> They're not ever becoming public. I mean, maybe, you never know. Maybe I might release one or two. But yeah, I don't really want people to see them. Save them for the documentary. Yes, yeah, yeah. Save them for the documentary. When uh, when was the last time you hopped on there and had a scroll through memory lane? Oh, all the time. You know, it's one of, like, you know, when I just, it's just a funny thing to show people. I showed everyone, you know, you just whack on, like, oh, here's me, eight-year-old, doing a cover of Justin Bieber's Boyfriend. Yeah, it's just, it's everyone's going to laugh. And I, you know, I'd like to laugh at myself. I think it's ridiculous. I was wearing, you know, those glasses that you can pick up in Camden Market that make you look like a robot. <laughs> and I spiked up my hair with gel. And yeah, it's just class to be able to go back and watch those things and laugh at yourself. I think it's nice to laugh at yourself a little bit sometimes. Oh, that sounds like a vibe, man. I think you should bring that look back. <laughs> it was the year six disco <laughs> look, man. Do you ever do the same thing with your own music? Do you ever kind of have a listen back to that and kind of think about where you were in your life at that time? Yeah, hundred percent. It's it, as I said, it's weird to listen back to things like Teenage Hat and try and remember where I was at the time of, of being so lonely and you know never having never having be, had anything with a girl and 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 now be like yeah. I'm an adult now, I'm 20 years old, I've got a girlfriend of two years, I live away from home, and it's just wild how far I've come. Is it weird immortalising an experience like that that was just slightly painful? Yeah, but I mean, I've got a terrible memory, I think partly because I smoke a little too much weed, but I, yeah, I just cannot remember anything, so I'd really try and just document everything um, so that I can look back and, you know... What's weird is that I've I've grown up in a generation where my whole life has been online. You know, I've been on Facebook since I was six. So I would be able to, when I'm, you know, 75, show my grandkids me doing a cover of Justin Bieber's Boyfriend with my hair spiked up at the age of eight, which is, you know, I nev- my grandparents could never show me anything like that. They can show me a single photo of when they were a kid. Um, but you're just not going to be able to understand things like that. So it's crazy that I'll be able to show my kids those YouTube videos. Something quite kind of crazy about that. Yeah, it's it's it is a bit. It does make me think though. Like, damn, my whole life has been online. You know, Facebook probably knows literally everything about me. And I I bought I bought a VR headset recently, which is made by Facebook. So now they've got everything. They can see where I'm at. They they know everything since I was the age of eight. You can upload your consciousness. Yes. Yeah. I'm excited for the day. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we're taking it, we're kind of speaking about the early days there, if we're taking it right back to the start, when you listen to this new single, and some of the stuff you've been putting out recently, actually, they kind of have those 90s infused chorus, that slightly oasis thing going on in particular mm-hmm. with a new one. Were you at Oasis's last gig? Yes, I was. You've done your research. <laughs> wow. Uh, yes, I was at Oasis's. I'm not sure if it was their like last, last gig, but it was their last big tour. I saw them at, at Wembley. Um, but it was weird because I'm not really... A huge oasis fan neither are like a 90s music fan um and it's kind of bizarre how my music sounds like that because i think i kind of went on the same journey as oasis where i've always been kind of hugely into the beatles but also into rock elements and that sort of combined into the kind of what like how oasis happened um 
which is yeah weird i mean when i went and saw oasis i didn't really know who they are i kind of only knew wonder war and i was i was more excited to go to the glee concert after that which was my second <laughs> concert ever <laughs> It's kind of cool to see how, you know, Oasis take those influences and fashion it onto their own thing and, you know, merge it with other things that they're into. And then you do the same and kind of create something that has similar elements, but at the same time is doing something totally different. Yeah, exactly. I never, I, yeah, I don't listen to 90s music. Yeah, I'd say maybe the biggest influence on the stuff from the 90s is like Beck. That sort of stuff comes through and was like intentionally trying to come through. But the other stuff, me sounding kind of a little bit like Liam Gallagher has come out of nowhere. I never intended to to sound a little bit like Liam Gallagher but you know me just being in a studio and, and being able to sing louder and open up my voice rather than in my room has, has, has made that sound come about. Do you perform differently when you're in the studio? Oh yeah I mean I was I was saying to my mate Mark it's like it's so much easier to perform more in a studio because at home you know if I shout um, you know, waking up or an apple juice. I'll get my dad banging on the on the, on on the wall saying, "Shut the shut the fuck up." So uh, now I can I can scream stuff and really put all of my energy into performance, like vocal wise. It's interesting you mentioned Beck as well because his kind of last two records, you can really hear their kind of influence creeping into your stuff in terms of that kind of madcap idiosyncratic production that's you know kind of spark i think the main influence i was trying to like odelay sort of era was you know the sort of break beats but with acoustic guitar and everything sort of distorted was kind of the thing that i wanted to go for i've always loved that sort of things ties the goal as well where it's just an acoustic run through of a fuck off overdrive and it just sounds beefy that's what you wanted to do then and kind of say with your music how has that kind of changed and evolved with time i don't know i'm never really thinking too deep into what i want my music to be and and how i want it to come across i just try and, and make music that i like how it sounds and then hope that other people like it too i think i the main real change is that i wanted to i wanted to make music that sounded like it was played live and then you could come see us live and you know hear the sound and be like right yeah that's spotify and then then i can take this and, and listen to it live and be like that's the same song you know because for ages we've been playing these songs but but not had them up i guess if you thought too much about it it would kind of undermine what we've been speaking about you know the candidness and the honesty at the heart of it yeah yeah i mean that's always what i've tried to apply and i think my time where I was weakest songwriting wise was when I, I was overthinking that sort of thing.